Good morning, I'm Rachel, this is Anna, and this is Sanjay, and we are very excited for today's panel on education and its role in social justice, Avenues for Change, bringing together grassroots and academic perspectives to discuss how activists, academics, school leaders, and students are mobilizing in response to the most pressing issues facing Philadelphia schools. First, we're very excited to welcome Professor Sarah goldrick Rabb, a professor of higher education, policy, and sociology at Temple University, and founding director of the Hope Center for College, Community, and Justice. Professor Goldrick Rabb is best known for her innovative research on food and housing insecurity in higher education, having led the four largest national studies on the subject, and for her work on making public higher education free. Mr. Jimenez is a dedicated educator who for the last 14 years has worked with students in Philadelphia from preschool age to the post-secondary level. Along with teaching at the high school level, Mr. Jimenez has facilitated several professional developments with colleagues in the school district, the local community, and at post-secondary institutions. Siobhan Savage is the principal of Henry C. Lee Elementary School in West Philadelphia. With 100 students holding individualized education plans and approximately 16% identifying as English language learners, Lee has seen significant gains in student achievement, attendance, and school climate under her leadership. Prior to her role at Lee, Mrs. Savage served as a teacher, school improvement coordinator, special education and student support administrator, and education and public finance attorney. She is a member of the Fund for Philadelphia School District and a 2019 Newborough Fellow for, at the Philadelphia Academy of School Leaders. Moderating this panel is Anna Harkin, a Penn Law 2L and education policy student at the Penn Graduate School of Education. Before we begin, we begin please note that to allow those who couldn't Join us in person today to enjoy the conversation and for CLE purposes. This event is being recorded and live streamed. If you have any questions, please speak to anyone from TPIC or Kanisha. We'll also have a Q&A at the end of our panel, so if you have a question during the panel, please raise your hand and a student will bring you a note card and we'll get to those at the end. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Ra Thank you Rachel. Good morning, everyone. I'm a former teacher, so I'm going to ask that we try that again. Good morning, everyone. If social justice is your jam, you've come to the right place. I can't think of a more important issue to discuss in our time than social justice. And if you're like me and you're committed to tackling racial and economic inequality, it would be a disservice for us to not discuss educational equity. I'm so excited that we're here at Penn Law um, centering uh, this conversation on education with our panelists. So let's get started. I'd like for us to start easy. So I want to ask my panel here, in your opinion, and this is a question that's open to everyone, we'll get to individual questions, but I want to throw this out there. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing education? Good morning, everyone. I would like to preface all of my answers by saying that I speak on behalf of Siobhan Savage and not on behalf of the School District of Philadelphia. As a school district employee and a native Philadelphian, I have been here and in and out of education for the majority of my career. Um, and in my current role, I would say that our biggest issue is inequitable funding, point blank. When you look at how school districts are funded, not just here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but across the country, we have relied heavily on formulas that um, really look at people's property values and based upon the previous panel on housing you can see how that would squarely affect how we fund schools it is important for us as a society to recognize that all children need and are required to have equal opportunity in education and in order to access that we have to fund it appropriately now the idea of equity in education however, does not mean that everybody gets the same amount of money. And I think that needs to be part of the discussion as well because in communities that have traditionally and historically been um, underfunded, 
underrepresented and not well supported, they are going to need and require more funding now to really remedy the issues and the inequities that have been created in the past. If I can piggyback on that, I want to note that that funding inequity extends into higher education. Um, and it does so in ways that advocates and researchers have documented are so profound that if we were allowed to in higher ed, we would probably see lawsuits over that funding. We send the most money to the schools that enroll the least vulnerable students. We send the most money uh, to institutions with existing large endowments that prop up substantial gates to entry in the first place. Um, as an alumni of this institution, I will very bluntly say that includes Penn. Uh, this institution receives far more dollars, public, public dollars, local, state, and federal, than does the Community College of Philadelphia. And yet it does not pay its pilot taxes to the city. Uh, we at Temple University are test optional because we know that standardized tests tell us next to nothing about how well students will do in college. We're still not who we need to be at Temple, I don't believe. But when we become affordable, we will be more accessible and affordable. But to say that an elite institution is affordable because it offers substantial, substantial scholarships funded by its endowment to which no one can get access because they cannot get in, that also is not funding equity. So I would strongly agree with you. Yeah, this is a huge question. And uh, hopefully I don't go too far like in the existential aspect. But I think uh, the biggest issue with education is kind of an existential issue that our society is facing. Um, when we have much more emphasis on numbers and data, I can speak from my own experience as a teacher. I have to do a, a ridiculous amount of paperwork just to justify kind of a kid struggling in my class, which is the supports that we should provide it. But at the same time, I'm not given the time on my own time uh, to work on that. And I have four children, y'all. And I don't really got time to be doing this and doing that and checking off boxes. But as a result, many of my colleagues leave education on an average of two to three years. So 50% of uh, teachers that enter into the school district of Philadelphia leave within those first three years. So I've seen people come and go, and I've only been in my building right now for seven years, and I'm an OG in my building. Um, so this lack of institutional continu continuity of educators and even developing their pedagogical practice also kind of feeds into this larger cycle of just pushing kids through, teachers getting, you know, worked to, to, to death and then leaving and then everybody become disillusioned. That reinforced the concepts at the very basis of our society that black and brown children can't learn the same way or, or can't do as well. And, and, and ultimately that is also tied to the fact that when they play with these numbers, we're actually doing a disservice to actually real deep thinking and learning in the classroom. So, like, I could tell you right now, suspensions in the Philadelphia School District are at record lows. That's because they're not suspending anybody. Um, I can tell you that the number of graduation rates are higher, but that's because they're not failing anybody. And so this perverse cycle just becomes more image than substance. And I think that is the, 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 a reflection of where our society is at right now. That we look at the screens, we pay attention to the distractions, and we're losing focus of what the purpose of education is. The purpose of education is not to turn out a widget, it's to make a human being. And that has been lost in a lot of places where we just have technocrats kind of playing with the overall structure and trying to tweak it at the edges and claiming that's reform when in reality it's undermining what we should actually be doing. And that definitely gets at that piece around how do I as a principal make sure I have enough staff in the building so that my teachers can plan together, don't burn out, have the opportunity to talk about the existential pieces of education and why we are here and what our vision and mission is around who we are creating and what children we want to leave our building. It's a resource issue because unfortunately, I, I don't have enough teachers to do that. Yeah. And, and I, if they had some money somewhere for us, it would make, a lot, make, it, would make it a lot easier.
And, and, and you're a great ed, uh, administrator, I can tell. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and just to veggie back deeper off of the uh, funding issue, yeah. in Pennsylvania, if you look at how funding is actually across the board, it has less to do with socioeconomic status. And the number one indicator of how little or how much funding you get is actually racially based. And in Pennsylvania, it's almost ranked, I think, 49th out of the nation's 50 states. So that's where we're at uh, in this city. Building off uh, some of the points that uh, you all have made, I would like to ask, um, the achievement gap and access to a quality education are key in many conversations on education. What do you believe are the most effective avenues uh, to increase opportunities for children who historically have uh, been underserved? And I'd love it if Ms. Savage and Mr. Jimenez speak from the K-12 experience and if Professor Goldrick would speak to the long-term implications of that. That's a deep question. Yes. I think it does, again, go back to that issue around funding equity, but also really as a society and a community being able to diagnose and determine what children need based upon the vision we have for the students that we graduate. I know everybody has heard the party line around, you know, the kids are being prepared for careers that don't exist. They are being prepared for technologies that we don't necessarily have right now. Where is the nimbleness and the flexibility in the education system to adjust and address those things? And also, in terms of the achievement gap, really thinking about what that gap is and how we are defining it. Are we talking about just achievement? Are we talking about behavior? Are we putting real supremacist ideas around what children of color, children with ability differences, children that come from different socioeconomic classes, what they should do or what they should have when they come to school in terms of skill sets. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation around that needs to be had at a deeper level and really building by building, neighborhood by neighborhood, as well as in districts and as a society at large because the ability of certain neighborhoods or communities to fund their kids education a different way or provide more monetary support than others really gets at the base of where that achievement gap comes from. This is cyclical and it is historical and it is long lasting and it's gonna take a lot of depth of mindset, practice, growth, change, mindset for us to really get at what it is that we should provide and how we close that gap. I can't sit here and tell you that there's one particular curriculum that works or we just provide behavior supports because kids have behavior issues. It's so much deeper than that. So much deeper than that. I'd strongly agree with that. And I'd say that around the mindset issue is a, you know, frankly, speaking to what you were saying about the purpose of education in the first place, I really dislike this language around achievement gap. Um, I spent a long time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I think my colleague there, Gloria Ladson-Billings, really nails it when she talks about this as measuring educational debt. And we're going to talk about student debt later, but I'm talking about it just revealing what we have done to minoritized populations and the debt that we owe them in order for them to even have access to to do anything like what we call achieve. The other thing that it does is similar, I think, to language of grit, which I firmly reject, mm -hmm. is it diagnoses a dehumanizing culture. So if you need grit to survive in school, let's be honest about what's happening in school, right? And I think that you know, what we don't recognize, and I, I'm working so hard on this at the higher ed level because actually it trickles up to us right now, is this notion that our students are humans first, and our teachers are humans first, and our staff and our administrators are humans first, and this is a profoundly dehumanizing system as it's currently structured um, that leads a lot of people to actually view education as suspect, which I think in turn creates a virtuous cycle where we, we defund it in part out of suspicion that it is not really here for us. Yeah, and um, I just want to build off of that also. You know, in Philadelphia, we have no librarians. I think seven out of 215 schools have a librarian. 
and a lot of those librarians are funded by friends groups of those schools. So even some of the most uh, you know concentrated socioeconomic uh, classes on a higher level are able to get librarians through their own resources. But schools like mine in Kensington, we use our library for a behavioral resource room. Um, and that's just a reflection of the overall issue and, and state where we're at. And uh, I want to problematize the achievement gap narrative also. I, I think it's built off of this idea that something's wrong with our kids. And I think that's also tied to race. I mean, it is tied to race. Um, and we have to be honest, even why the first test, IQ tests, SATs were even created in the first place. You know, they were created by eugenists to justify kind of how some groups are superior and some groups are inferior. And I think those things are still happening. Um, we live in a society where we need people to work at Walmart more than we need teachers and lawyers. Um, and we're not honest about that. So we might have anomalies and be like, look at this kid, he came from nothing. And that comes to disrupt the narrative, which actually takes away the focus of where we're actually at. And all indicators of life quality, uh, of wealth and income, it has remained stagnant, especially for black children in Philadelphia and across the nation, across the board. Real wealth has not even really gone up. It actually has gone down since, uh, since the housing crash of 2008, 2009. And just like talking about the last panel, that was also discrimination of housing then, that even major banks and corporations had to pay back black families because that was proven, black and Latino families because that was proven. So like all these issues are intermingled with one another to the point where I can tell you right now, like my colleagues tell me, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pass that kid because he's not capable of that. And it feeds into kind of like how all of us are indoctrinated with these like anti-black views. Um, and we're not honest about that also. Um, you know, at the very foundation of this society, uh, black people were never meant to be free. And then we're telling people, oh, well, it's all good. You know, look at, look at Obama. Look what King got. You know, all you got to do is pull yourself up from your bootstraps. And if you don't do it, then it's your fault. You failed. And the kids are internalizing that now. They, they step in my class in 11th grade and already they already have believed that they're incapable of really thinking. And I'm talking about thinking, y'all. What do I need to put down, sir, so I can just get a grade, so you can just check off that box and I can keep it moving? And the question never comes, well, have you marinated on the, the, the idea in which we're trying to present? And then, do you agree, do you disagree? And sometimes you have to like, it's like pulling teeth out to even get kids to that point. To, it's like pulling teeth out to get my colleagues to that point sometimes. <laughs> this is being recorded, isn't it? I need a, um, <laughs> But, you know, that's the, that's the larger work that we need to do. And, and, and like both, both of my co-panelists have, have definitely lovely said, it's, it's a cycle. Um, and, and we haven't tried, and I would argue that we haven't realistically tried to break out of that cycle. So. Ms. Savage, I have a question for you regarding effective measures uh, of student growth and teacher effectiveness. I think both of the, your other panelists have, have also pointed out to that. Um, but if, so if you wanted to jump in after, but questions directed to you first. In terms of are they real, are they no, what necessary? Would, what, would you <laughs> what would you suggest as a effective means to measure student growth and teacher performance? Mm. In a way that is not perpetu perpetuating this racial narrative that we've pointed at. I have been thinking about this since I started teaching 20 years ago because I am older than I look. Um, and honestly, for me, when I think about student achievement and what it is that I would like my eighth graders to leave my building with, it is not just that academic prowess and that general curiosity that makes them an ongoing and continuous learner. I want to know if they are people that respect each other have boundaries, understand our history as a country, think about social norms and cues and know when to question them, are prepared to engage at a higher level, and are ready for the secondary school environments that we send them into. Are they healthy? Do they understand safety and how to maintain their health and safety? 
Do they understand family dynamics and have the coping mechanisms to really measure and be reflective of themselves? Those are the kinds of achievement measures that we don't have right now in our system. We are looking at whether or not students can achieve according to standards, which I think is not necessarily a bad system because it was intended to level the playing field in terms of where students were educated. The idea was all students at a certain grade level, no matter their background, their income, their geographic location, were taught the same thing. We focus on that, but we also focus on the other pieces. And when we think about the holistic needs of our kids in our building, we make sure that you know we're teaching them how to resolve conflicts, we're teaching them how to advocate for themselves, and they often come advocate for themselves to me about things like recess. And the food is not great. Ms. Savage, you need to find us another lunch vendor. Um, <laughs> making sure that they know and understand that they have a voice is, is important as well. So there's that piece of it. And when you think about those things, then you can better measure teacher effectiveness. Because regardless of what Danielson says, are my teachers and is my staff preparing our students in that way for all of those other pieces and all of those other things? And if I come across people that are not, that conversation has to be held because it creates and jeopardizes safety and health in the building in general. Children are children. They take their direction from adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just say, if they entered higher education with the skills that you just described, able to advocate for themselves, comfortable with asking for help and demanding it when they need to, and able to navigate their family dynamics, we would see higher college graduation rates. It has had nothing to do with, with you know, we, we have not seen increases as students are coming in saying, I've passed more tests. In fact, they say, but I don't understand why I'm not doing well. I did well on those tests. And the number one thing that they do is they hide um, from, from all sorts of things that they have every right to speak up for. So I think it'd be revolutionary if that was where the focus was. And, and, and let me just say, talk real, some trash on Danielson and some positive things, right? <laughs> Um, Danielson even says that, she's, that it's not supposed to be a punitive evaluative tool. It's supposed to be something where a conversation can happen between a teacher and an administrator on the how to deepen the practice. But unfortunately, it has become another box checking situation where it just be like, oh, well, you got like a two and then you have a, like a 1.5 on this. Believe me, it's really like that, y'all. And then even when it comes to the state, a lot of the test scores from at, at the school level, if your school building score is low, and even if you don't teach a sus tested subject, your overall rating becomes lower, which disincentivizes some of the best educators to stay in the schools where they need to be. Mr. Jimenez, uh, my next question is for you, and it's around the role teachers can have in promoting a justice-centered education agenda. Um, and you mentioned frameworks. Uh, and we know that those are real barriers. Um, but beyond that, what can educators do? Um, first thing is have no fear. I think a lot of educators walk around fearful, well, I can't say this, or I can't do this, or you know, what if we do this, we might get in trouble. Um, my position for the last 11 years, I haven't been written up yet, or I haven't been fully written up yet, um, <laughs> is, is to step into that classroom every single day and look at those children like they're my own children and uh, recognize that their world is, has been unfortunately limited um, to the point of stepping into my classroom, especially teaching in Kensington, um, where some of the most concentrated poverty um, exists in the city of Philadelphia and the opioid crisis or the opioid academic you know, center point in this whole city. Um, what justice looks like is actually challenging the students to think about what justice actually is. Um, I think a lot of us um, in our society have a misconception and think justice is just, uh, you know, tweaking things here, tweaking things there, and then everything will be fair. Um, and, and fail to see that at the very root and foundation of this society is based off of racialized exploitation. 
Um, and I think a lot of the students that I walk in, when I tell, teach them about how George Washington, the first president, took nine teeth out of his slave's mouth for his dentures, uh, the kids are like, oh my God, like, and then they're like, who's that? Um, <laughs> which speaks to a larger endemic issue of uh, lack of intellectual engagement and actually like picking up books and thinking and learning. So every single day, um, for me, putting readings in front of texts and taking that painstakingly long process of having the kids actually go through it has been a form of justice creating. Because when they come to my class the next day and be like, I saw this on TV and it was related to this is what we read the other day and this is what I think about and this is what my mom said and then my cousin said this. You know right there they're drawing those connections. And those type of conversations spread like wildfire. Um, and then encouraging them to not only speak about it in the abstract sense, but that only through life's experiences can we actually truly develop a uh, clearer sense of where we need to go. So I always use this quote uh, from a rapper in my class, and it's like, uh, it's uh, practice theory practice. Wisdom is organically gr uh, grown, it's not prepackaged. So you can't give the kids, you can't give them this type of sense. They have to develop it th themselves and then go out into the world and practice, and then go back to the drawing board to reflect about what they've learned from that process, and then go back into the world again. Uh, and, and, and the one thing I always say to my students is like, you go through the five stages of grief in my class. You know, anger, denial, depression, you know, negotiation, then acceptance. And I always tell them, you want to get to acceptance, you know, and accept what it really is, not what we wish it is to be, not what we think it is, not what other people tell it is, but what it really is. And uh, it's, it's a continuous cycle, believe me. I, I've had kids get to acceptance and then get angry again and then start crying, you know, and walk out because they can't handle it. Um, but once we get to that point, it, it, it becomes a burden. It becomes a responsibility um, that you can't be neutral on a moving train and you have to be in this world. And if you don't, if you don't do that, you become this, an object. And an object, when it's no longer needed, is just tossed to the side and it doesn't define itself. So uh, Principal Savage might call this a pen, might call it a stylo, I call somebody, stab somebody in the eye with, right? But this thing can't argue with me because it doesn't define itself. So that's where we do that type of work inside the classroom where you challenge them to really think, how are you defining yourself in this world and how do you define this world within itself and then we can start having what uh, Robert Kelly called uh, the radical imagination, um, to think of something beyond what's already been created and, 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 and move forward. Thank you for that. Professor Goldrick, earlier you said um, if students came into higher ed with all the skills that Principal Savage was describing, it would make the world of a difference. Um, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit and ask you um, about your 2008 study where you followed uh, 3,000 students in public uh, universities and colleges um, and asked uh, what you learned and what was surprising. Yeah. Um, so backwards. I can't believe it's been 12 years. So 2008, um, I was a professor at Wisconsin, as I said, at Madison, and we had this extraordinary opportunity. Most people just talk about low-income college students. They call them Pell recipients because many of them receive the federal Pell Grant. Um, some members of Congress like to compare them to welfare recipients, but they don't get to know them as humans. And uh, we had an extraordinary opportunity with um, a lot of uh, philanthropic investment to spend six years getting to know those 3,000 students as they tried to get degrees and watched as only about half of them did. The most transformative moment of the study actually came very early on. It was the fall of 2008. And so, you know, think about that in the national context as well, in terms of the bottom falling out economically, in terms of President Obama and, and all of those things. And a member of my team was uh, in Milwaukee doing some interviews at the public university there. All of our interviews with college students, we start with no assumptions whatsoever. Um, we just simply ask people, how's it going? 
That's what we think is the best way to begin a conversation and get to know another human. And this 18-year-old woman looked at my graduate researcher and said, I'm not okay. And my student said to her, why? What's going on? And the young woman responded, I haven't eaten in three days. That was not something we expected. It's not like, as a sociologist, we didn't know about segregation and poverty, right? It's not like we didn't know we were in Milwaukee, one of the most segregated and impoverished cities in the nation, and actually in Wisconsin, which is home to the largest black-white gap in the entire nation. It's not like we didn't know that. But if you looked at the time for explanations of why people weren't doing well in college, food insecurity was just not a thing. And uh, so we, as scientists, said, we're going to take her seriously, of course, and we're going to begin to ask the other students systematic questions to see if this is actually a, a thing. And it turned out that across the 42 public two-year and four-year colleges in Wisconsin, this was widespread. So was housing insecurity. So was homelessness. And Follow that on, five years later, I find myself giving presentations nationally and being told, this must just be a Wisconsin problem. <laughs> yeah, right, that was my response, but it took a long time to get anybody to take it seriously. And so in 2015, five years ago, I first partnered with a national organization to start sending surveys to assess food and housing insecurity out to the nation's colleges. And the problem, of course, is the colleges don't have to allow that assessment. And frankly, they don't want it. Most of them would rather not talk about this, and the federal government has not ever asked these questions of students, despite spending around 30 million a year surveying college students since the 1970s. So we did it. We got 10 colleges the first year, all community colleges in seven states. Wrote about it in the New York Times. The next year, 70 colleges joined us, and each year since then, it's increased. On Wednesday, February 12th, we'll release the fifth annual survey. We now have data from over 330,000 students at over 400 colleges and universities, including five right here in Philadelphia. Our numbers have not changed. It doesn't matter where we're surveying. It doesn't matter what the response rate is. It's always low, by the way. These students don't do surveys. Um, we continue to find that students at community colleges, about one in two of them, have experienced food insecurity in the last 30 days. At four-year publics, it's around one in three. We further find homelessness rates between 12 to 20 percent at these institutions. It's remarkably persistent. It reflects all the disparities. Although I will say, even though we see higher rates among African American students, indigenous students, Latinx students, and so on, we still find a whole lot of white people in these problems too. And the reason I think is very straightforward. We have wanted to push forward with higher education without properly financing it. And there are now human consequences. And students, because they are thought of by legislators as privileged and coddled, and we talk more about how helicopter parents need to leave them alone than we do about the fact that most of them are on their own already. We've disenfranchised them from the very supports that other folks at least have access to in theory if they don't have money. So things like SNAP, right? Things like the low income housing tax credit, they cut college students out of it. We are now running a whole series of interventions to try to help higher education wake up to a problem that K-12 knew it had. And we're trying to have the conversation with Congress about how things like the National School Lunch Program need to be part of higher ed. But this is at a moment when most people are just saying college is a joke and not worth funding. It's a tough situation. And I just want to say something. I think when we talk about education, there's so much to be discussed. So I'm sitting here thinking of 12 follow-up questions that I could have to that. Um, but just as a short uh, follow-up to that, uh, Professor Goldrick, you have been, um, and you alluded to that in your last response, but you have been an advocate for uh, tuition-free college. And I was wondering, what role do you think um, we as lawyers, well, me a law student, but you know, 
get in there, uh, as lawyers and advocates play in making this a reality? Yeah, I mean, first let me say just a moment about the idea itself, because it's being frequently mischaracterized. I think a lot of people believe that the free college policies are a joke, that it's going to be fast, cheap, and out of control, that it's only about tuition, not living expenses, and that it will deepen existing inequalities. Um, because access to college right now is so unequal, that it would be a transfer, essentially, of a benefit upward. Those arguments were all made by those who did not want to expand elementary school access to secondary education. So I want to be clear, there aren't too many people in this country who would actually argue that we should roll back the advance that we made that transformed the 20th century. Um, I think there's a lot of different roles to play. Um, part of the role is in helping people understand that student debt, which is a very important issue to tackle right now, and we should help people who are dealing with all kinds of fraud and you know, laws that, that are not living up to their promises and bad programs. We have to do more, though, than just stick Band-Aids on those things. We have to work to prevent the debt from accumulating again. And I'm very concerned we have a large number of people who are saying, I will only support transforming the price of higher education in the future if you repair my past debt. I have real concerns about that. That's not how we make progress in this country. I think we can build coalitions that do both. But I also want to make sure that we are careful that when we fund public higher ed going forward, we do so adequately. And so as I alluded to earlier, um, there are a lot of us that believe that actually we could begin to file some suits around inadequacy of public funding and inequitable distribution of funding in higher ed. And I would refer you to the Century Foundation's report that came out last year on adequacy with regard to community colleges. They are doing some really good work at laying a framework um, for, for that piece. And I do believe that, frankly, if we're going to do something in the next three to five years, the first thing we do is to make the next two years of higher education fully free. Can I add a little something to that? Absolutely. I am a Penn Law alumni, and I actually was an education attorney and a public finance attorney, and I sat in your chairs at one point, and I remember specifically what it was to be a law student and try to figure out how I could manifest some change in a system that was so large that it seemed that it was inaccessible for me to even get in. There are so many different avenues to even just what do these roles look like in different places and I don't know that you guys are even aware of the explicit avenues that exist. There's legislative policy because if you think about it everything that touches education is mandated by law. I'll say that one more time. Everything in education is mandated by law. There are people sitting somewhere writing those laws. Those people work for politicians. Those people work for departments of education. They create regulations. They work in the federal government. They work in the state and local governments. Those people are lawyers. I think the biggest misstep that we've made as a society is allowing people that don't actually go into schools, interact with children, teach in colleges, work with teachers, educate children, whether they are 2, 5, 12, or 18, dictate what we do in the education system. Mm -hmm. I would implore you, as attorneys, to explore what that looks like. Some of you in this room may have actually taught, some of you may have not. If you are interested in pursuing this as a path, there are general counsel jobs in education for districts, in higher education, mm -hmm. <laughs> people jump all the time back and forth between careers. Explore the school system and decide where you can get in to fit in because sometimes it is as easy as working for a politician as a chief of staff and when a revision of the IDEA comes out, having some perspective into how that should be changed. These jobs exist everywhere, and I just don't think that people realize they exist. People fall into them and don't know or have the appropriate background, and then they spend years trying to catch up. But the system is already what it is. If we're going to change it, we have to really look at the legislative piece of it, and we haven't done that. Because the one thing about lawsuits I can say, enforcement is hard. We can sue everybody in the world, y'all. I used to do that. Well, I defended them. 
and I won a lot. But it's hard to enforce an actual judgment, especially across a district. Corrective action is hard to enforce, especially in systems that are as large as ours. The legislative piece is key, and that's where I see the biggest lack of depth. Mr. Jimenez, uh, school choice has become a part of the narrative. Um, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on what are the cost benefits and how the charter movement has impacted education, specifically here in Philly. All right. Um, well, that's like almost a third rail in Philadelphia to talk about. Um, if you're trying to maintain positive relationships with people involved in education, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm just a teacher, right? Um, so as a parent, I'll start from that angle. Um, me and my wife wrestled with this issue. Um, so our local neighborhood school is in Logan. And uh, we sent our oldest son because, you know, we believe in public education. My wife wanted to get involved in the school and be like, it should be okay regardless of some of the indicators of the school that were problematic. Um, and so my oldest son went through the school there um, and went through many incidents. Um, when in first grade, he would come home and tell us that his the teachers were yelling at him and be like, if you keep on acting like this, you're gonna go to jail. Um, and just like when we complain to the school and be like, oh, well, we'll say something. And then it just goes off into the sunset. Um, and then issues around bullying, um, and everything. Um, and then as a result, our two other children, we have four, I said that right. Um, the two other children we ended up sending to an Afrocentric charter school that's now closed. Um, and they had a much more positive experience, um, but then it, it got closed due to the lawsuits, due to special ed <laughs> and all that stuff. Um, and then we had to put them in Logan, and then after a little bit in Logan, then we put them into another school. So. Our options are actually limited um, for school choice. So when people talk about school choice just for charter schools, I think that starts to get a little problematic where if we want to support the public system and really like influence and, and not contribute to capital flight, human capital flight, which happens too much oh, at these schools, we want to really emphasize the fact that right now our five-year-old is going to start kindergarten next year. Where are we going to send them? We don't want to send them to Logan. We had a bad experience there. Um, we don't want to send them to charter schools because charter schools aren't necessarily better places. Um, so as a result, it's like we're stuck in between a rock and a hard place. And all the talk about school choice, I think, undermines the overall need for kind of like opening up the whole system and rewarding schools that do uh, produce it. Not like the high school magnet model, which currently exists, but something where we can like start to like individualize schools and allow kind of more citywide enrollment into the public system, which doesn't really currently exist. Um, and then I would also, I'm a huge teacher union uh, advocate, as you can tell. Um, I also believe that the charter school system needs to start talking about how do we unionize those teachers in those schools because those teachers are only working with one-year contracts, and in too many places, they're worked even harder than in the public system. Um, and I know several people that let the charter school system come to the public system, and it's like, wow, this is actually enjoyable um, compared to kind of the grueling, everyday expectation and number game that they're playing at the magnet school, even though there's a number game in the public system. Um, but not to get too lost in the weeds in that, I gotta say that I don't think we correct the problem by privatizing uh, school. Uh, I don't think we correct the problem by outsourcing the services inside schools. Um, and if anything, I think the model that currently exists that they call school choice, which I really think is a misnomer, I think just reinforces kind of like the structure that currently exists. So if you look at statistics, charter schools are not actually even turning out better numbers, if that even matters. I don't know why I keep on referring back to numbers when I'm talking all this trash. But it doesn't produce any better results than schools do. Uh, graduation rates, achievement on a college level, like it's not happening. 
So like it just kind of shifts the blame and then puts a Band-Aid on it. Mm -hmm. So like I've worked with very closely with uh, charter school advocates within the city on issues around racial justice, racial inequality, how to address these issues, how to retain more black educators in schools. Um, and we can unite on those issues. Um, but when it comes to this deeper, larger conversation, it becomes very like in the weeds and very few real ways of, of coming up with solutions are actually being talked about. And it's us versus them. And then I think there's a lot of interests that want that to be true. Even though we're dealing with the same kids in the same city with the same passion to change the way education works. So as long as we move and start to have real discussions like that and step away from this idea that, you know, well, we have limited resources and we're all going to get messed over. I'm trying not to cuss here. We're all going to get messed over, right, um, if we just fight amongst each other instead of working together to actually transform education. Uh, hopefully that answers that. That's a very hard question. Can I ask a clarifying question as well? Yes. Because you talked specifically about public and charters. Yeah. My deeper question is school choice for who? Mm -hmm. Because there are Catholic schools, there are private schools, there's private nursery schools, there's, there's many avenues in education that do not include just the public system because charter and public schools are all publicly funded. I think the larger question is when people opt out of that public system entirely, mm -hmm. What does that do to the public system? We have a number of people that, you know, they actually have the finances and the resources to put their children in private schools and Catholic schools, and they have chosen to opt out. What does that then do to our public system? I, I think it disrupts kind of the community cohesion that we should be developing. Um, and let's be honest about even how private schools and Catholic schools even operate. A lot of them reinforce racialized segregation. Um, even charter schools right now are reinforcing uh, racialized segregation in places like the Northeast. Mass charter school that has just gotten an extension has invited more, you know, has like 70% uh, white population at that school. And that speaks to the larger issue. But then you look at Catholic schools and then they have the similar patterns of those racial uh, discrimination. And then private schools have always been a class kind of exclusion. And if race and class is tied together, by default, you're also having a racial exclusion. And so when they have little cookie cutters and like handouts, be like, well, look, we have this percentage of black students and we have these racial equity symposiums and we talk and we feel all good about it. But the, at the end of the day, they're still reinforcing as much as charter schools, as much as Catholic schools, the current structure that exists. So like I know a lot of people that I've worked with move out the city when they start to have kids. Um, and, it, and that even goes back to human flight because they want public education for the kids. They don't want to be paying twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year out of pocket and they can't afford that quite frankly on a teacher's salary, let alone with student debt. But when they go out there, those type of issues are draining even further from the human capital that we need to stay in the city to actually have some social economic integration in schools, which I would argue is more important than racial integration in the long term. Um, and as long as that is continuing to happen and as long as we think we call this thing choice and give these, you know, false scholarships to people which are just coupons to begin with, I think that you know, we're not really having the real heart of the discussion about how do we build group, uh, community cohesion, how do we start to actually start to identify with each other and instead of trying to take our kids away from what we view as problematic communities, which is also racially based, um, and not put a computer screen in front of them and be like, we're making progress, because innovation is not progress, necessarily. Ms. Savage, a, a question for you, and then I have some questions from the audience that we're going to shift to. As an administrator, how do you balance your administrative responsibilities with supporting your students and the needs of your community? Carefully. <laughs> I, being an administrator and having that command of 
I guess, the administrative requirements and the legalities around how we run schools uh, has helped me to really think hard about how I can balance the needs of my students, my staff, my families with these requirements. Um, the first step is even just being knowledgeable about what those requirements are and being very steeped and having depth in what the expectations are around how we operate our building, um, the different processes in place for our kids to actually apply to different schools, apply to high schools, how we run after school programs, how we provide additional supports. Knowing what those requirements are allows me to really examine deeply what the needs are and then marry the two. Because sometimes there are needs that I that are not necessarily addressed in these different requirements or policies that we can then structure supports for. There might be requirements that don't mesh with a particular set of needs, but if I know what the requirement is, I can then seek to help change that requirement. I think the bigger part of the conversation is not so much about balance and feeling that I am um, not empowered to do anything. For me and in my career, it has been more about knowing and understanding the system so I can change it. And I think that's the biggest part of how I lead versus how some others may lead. My interest is making sure that the system that I work in serves the children and the families before me. And if that requires me to sometimes go out on a limb, I sometimes you gotta go out on a limb. Because the other piece too is, you know, and the kids tell me this all the time, because I've taught them this and I don't know why I did it. Sometimes rules and laws are to be tested. That's why we have lawsuits, right? <laughs> Sometimes they test rules for me, <laughs> and sometimes I have to test rules above me. But at the end of the day, if I'm working in the best interest of children, which is what my job is to do, which is what my mission is to do, then I will accept the consequences of doing such. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience, and I think this could be applied to all levels of education. Uh, but the question says, how can educators who are at, at capacity operate from a trauma-informed lens to support their students? Uh, can I take that for a sec? Um, so uh, we haven't talked much about the situation facing the, the faculty in higher education um, at the institution where I work. The majority are now adjunct or non-tenure track faculty. Um, I'm one of the very, very few who can honestly go home and say to myself, I've got tenure, I'm in a union, I'm a full professor, and life's going to be okay. The uncertainty that they face and the heavy loads that they face teaching have demonstrable impacts for their students. And it isn't because they're not as good teachers. Um, and scientists are having some trouble with that. When they see a negative effect of having a, an adjunct faculty member on student outcomes, they think it's that the individual is a bad teacher, and it's actually their working conditions. Um, they have less time for their students. So in a situation like that, as they face their classrooms, and we have a growing number of students who might look what you could call disengaged, Right, so I spend a lot of time talking to faculty about their sleeping students. When, when professors in higher education see sleeping students, they go through a series of reactions, the first of which is usually a little bit of disgust, a little bit of, you don't belong here, you don't deserve to be here, you're not trying hard enough, something's wrong with you. Um, we're not trained to recognize the possibility that the student is sleeping because they have low blood sugar or the, because they haven't had anything to eat or the possibility that they haven't gotten a good night's sleep the night before, not because they were out partying, but because they don't have a place to sleep. We're not trained for any of that. Um, so it's reasonable when we talk about recognizing those things with faculty for them to say, are you really asking us to take on something new, something additional? Are you asking me to become a social worker on top of my existing job? And my answer is no. Um, but you do need to know one, and we do need to employ one, or more, ideally, on our campus. But the thing that they do see when they know this information, and they have a clue, at least, about what trauma can look like on students, is they do find it easier to do their jobs. It is easier when you're not 
spending the time putting up the wall between you and the student in terms of blaming them or blaming yourself and thinking that you are actually the problem, that you are not engaging enough. And it is actually easier if you instead pull the right lever more quickly and help connect that student to other resources rather than wait for them to get through the whole semester failing repeatedly and coming to you and begging for grade changes. So that's sort of the part we're at at this moment, which is to try to give folks without putting them through lengthy PD that they don't actually have, there's no practice of in higher ed. We don't talk about how to teach in higher ed, right? That's one of our dirty secrets. Um, so we got to give them like little tips that don't actually require putting any of that training into place. It's really challenging. You, you want to go? <laughs> A lot of prayer. Um, no, I'm just joking. Um, trauma. I mean, like, it's it's. We need social workers in every school. Um, we they need to be trained. Uh, they need to have union protections. They don't need to be from coming from outsourced coors. Um, also, I think it's also important that teachers have adequate training uh, around trauma, um, not an uh, online clickable thing, actual real by uh, certified folks. Um, I think also that we also need to be honest about racialized trauma um, and how some teachers reinforce that idea based on their own biases. So definitely anti-racist training is very important. Um, and I think you know, there's many levels to it, and we're only broaching the beginning of this conversation in a real way right now, even though we know this has always existed. Um, and as teachers, we are also on the slick social workers <laughs> and uh, problem solvers and, and uh, their, their friend, their enemy. You know, I, I have a lot of students who I've had a emotionally abusive relationships with towards me. Um, but being able to point that out to them and how that's toxic and then lead from example as an educator is just, I think, fundamentally at the teacher level, I think that's the conversation that our unions need to have. Um, we need to have with each other and we have to be purposeful when we're stepping into those spaces. And I'm gonna say something that's probably controversial because this is not often said about teachers, administrators, and educators, but we are human. Right, so there is that idea of vicarious trauma as well. The conversation that I have been having with other educators and educators in my building has not just been around being human, recognizing that your children are human, building relationship with the children, because sometimes just in that relationship, they will reveal things to you that let you know where they are. But also, what is the emotional load that you carry every day as the adult that is responsible for these children in this room? How are you caring for yourself? What is it that I can do to support and help you in that? Because these people view them as their children. These teachers have 30 kids and they take home all of that baggage with them every day. For my middle school teachers that might see 90 kids, they take that baggage home with them every day. Burnout is real and the burnout is real because we don't talk about it and we don't put the services in place for teachers to actually manage it, especially when we're not paying them enough for them to work just one job. So they therefore are carrying this baggage in addition to their workload home at 3.30 or on their way to their next job. I think the systemic issue around how we actually treat and pay teachers, particularly in urban education, is a significant one. And at some point, the conversation has to be not just about how we are supporting the kids, but how we're supporting the teachers. Because to me, it's, it's a beastly thing to continue to demand more and more of their time and effort when we're not even paying them, honestly, livable wages. How do we grapple with the nature and the culture of the education system that pushes kids through graduation? Do you agree or disagree? What solutions do you see fit? I would like to see the end of the grading system. Um, A to F stuff is, uh, is, I wish I can have more of like a pass fail scenario. Like you understand, bro, so you're moving on. And if not, you've got to do this level again because you, you failed, you know. Um, I, I think uh, less of an emphasis on like this, you know, graduation thing as something as just a, to get a job. 
I think too many times we tell our kids, you need to do this and that in order to get like a good job. And it's like, uh, it's, it's, education isn't that. Education should be something where it's like, you need to do this, that, and the other to become a better human being. Um, and I think if we emphasize that more and then we include that in how we evaluate students and then give teachers adequate time for their own professional development. Like I had to, I had to take off work today to come here, you know what I mean? Like, um, and just to even have conversations professionally with other professionals, you know, that's all volunteer time. We don't get paid to do that. And so like a lot of people don't have time for that. And it if, if it wasn't for my like supportive wife who, who is like down with all this type of conversation, I wouldn't be able to be out having those conversations and planning with other educators in a really authentic way. And I think that if we place that emphasis more on that process rather than the destination, well, that switching of that conversation, I think, would increase graduation rates, whatever that's worth. <laughs> but at the same time, those, those kids who come out of those situations would be better people. I, I want to underline the call to end grading. Um, and I've been so heartened that this has begun to be a conversation in the higher ed space as well. Um, I have a colleague named Jesse Stommel who has been doing a lot of really good work in this space. And it is amazing to me. I, I started doing ungrading um, about a year, year and a half ago at Temple. At first, I thought I wasn't allowed. <laughs> and then I decided, what does that even mean? I have tenure and I'm in a union. So, you know, so I just, right, well, that's why we do these. We do what we do, right? So, so I just told my students, I'm not grading you. I'm done because the science tells me that it's actually not helpful for your learning. And the most interesting thing to me was how they were so struggling to believe that that I had to have them do readings about how the grades are not actually helping them. And um, what I did have them do, of course, was assess themselves and their progress. And so I had them writing, it was about once a month, a fairly lengthy response to a set of questions, and you know, reading and engaging with those. And at the end of all of it, I saw exactly what I thought I would see. The students who I know I would have lost during the semester, the ones who would have stopped coming, the ones who, you know, frankly, would be losing their financial aid because of their grades at the end. They were all there, they were all attending, and they all said, this is what I want from college. The ones who had trouble were the ones that I think of as like the ones we try to recruit because their parents can pay more money and they come from the suburbs. And they were like, you got to stop doing this because we don't know any other way to know how we're doing. And mot he, this one man said, I cannot motivate myself if you do not give me a grade. And he said, you're doing so much disservice giving these people, these other, these, these other people. It was so fascinating. So the thing, <laughs> I think it will only work well if it's system wide, but I think the idea that it's less work for teachers would worry me. It's a ton of work. But it felt so much more rewarding and it was another way of bridging the gap that happens between the teacher and the learner. I felt like this was more of a partnership. Um, so now we're trying to just spread it among those of us who are allowed to try this first. And, and can I just, uh, real quick, I just want to add on top of that, um, and it's interesting you say that, about three years ago, I'm like, how can I disincentivize the box checking aspect of grading and incentivize more of the intellectual engagement that I want to see from my students? So I can't, unfortunately, not grade folks I would probably get written up for. Um, but I, I still don't have no fear. So I'm thinking, how can I manipulate that system? Because I understand how it works for my benefit. So I actually started uh, do, measuring students 30% of their overall grade because we're actually, the weights of our grades are controlled by the district. 30% mm -hmm. of the overall grade, I give them a woke grade. And I uh, give them, it's five, five levels. It's sleep, drowsy, disoriented, oh my awake, and woke. Um, and I actually have the students self-assess themselves and sit down with them and have a conversation, like an honest conversation, and be like, well, where do you think you're at? And, and it's very incredible. After a while, like by the middle of the year, students are very honest about where they're at and they're able to articulate to you why they think they are there and what they can do to do better. So like I've had kids actually say, well, I think I'm drowsy because I understand some of the concepts, but I'm having difficulty being able to articu you know, articulate that on a piece of paper. 
And I'm saying, well, yeah, that's true, but I think that you acknowledging that shows me that you're more disoriented and you're trying to make sense. So like, that's the level of conversation that happens. So it's, you know, at first it took some of the students a long time to get adjusted to such a thing. Um, but then at the same time, students come back and like, I've only had, in the three years I've been doing this, I've only had like four students get woke. And I know when they get there because they would never call themselves woke. Yes. Um, they recognize that education is a lifelong journey and this is just part of that process. And that's where I'm trying to get them to. And uh, that, that's how we can, in, on this level, that's interesting. I'm liberating that idea and taking it over uh, here. I have so. the rubric, <laughs> I have the indicators and everything I can show you, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the one question, though, around is if, if you stop giving grades is how do you determine whether or not they have actually mastered what you intended to teach and who then structures what we should teach? Mm -hmm. And I think that conversation is a deep one because, you know, we all get these standards that come down from on high and then we have to teach them across grade levels. And I understand that as a, as a societal move, that part of that is to build equity across systems. but there, I think there's always some flexibility. Oh yeah, no, I mean look, one of the questions they had was like, so I'm teaching quantitative literacy, right? And I put up a chart, it could be, it could be frankly just a chart showing you the relationship between money and college graduation. And they're not gonna be able to read it, let me tell you. Like 80% of them cannot read it during the first couple weeks. Um, it's not like I don't give them quizzes where they, I'm marking them, right? It's just that I'm not putting the grade on it. There might even be a number, but no grade. And they still receive that differently. And I think that is so important for us to hear. To be honest, I do have to submit a grade at the end, because if I do not, they will not be able to retain their athletic scholarships, right, all that stuff. But they nominate their grade, and I have the right to dispute their grade to them. And they grade themselves <laughs> way harder than I ever would have. And, and so, so I think that's the other thing. Like the system needs to shift yeah. in favor of that Dewey in process where students actually are reflective about their learning. Exactly. And we involve them in that conversation exactly. because what's happening now is we put a grade on them as opposed to actually asking them what they would think. Yeah. 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 And, and that encourages box, check, box checks check. and plagiarism, you know, che you know, cheating off the board, even teachers okay. cheating off the board, you know. Um, and, and we have to be honest about the, that that's a perverse incentive. Mm -hmm. um, and then put the emphasis on, on the student self-reflecting on their own educational process. We have a really important question here. Um, how do we tackle the school to prison pipeline? And what are your thoughts on the resegregation of public schools? Well, that's two separate questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it like fit on the index card, so I, I can't blame them. I would have tried that too. I, I think for me, the school to prison pipeline is the first one to address. Um, a lot of that is about mindset and what we prepare children for. I run a very large elementary school. We have had and seen a lot of achievement and success since I've been there. People ask me all the time what it is that I'm doing that's so different, and they never believe me when I tell them that I run it like an elementary school in Lower Marion. Because the mindset around what children in the building look like and what they should be treated like mm -hmm. has been such a mountain to climb. Mm -hmm. Children are children. They respond to quality, period. Mm -hmm. Best practice and quality. I restructured the building and we've been on the move. It has nothing to do with what they look like or their backgrounds or poverty. Kids like school. And if you structure schools that they like, they will achieve in school. Now getting, uh, getting around the adult mindset has been that, <laughs> that's a whole separate issue. But I think that that adult mindset is what creates that school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. Because we do come to this with you know biases, prejudices, frameworks around what kids and can, kids can and can't do. If you treat a child like a prisoner, they're going to become a prisoner. We have started treating children like children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I work on the other end of it. I think we should look at folks who are incarcerated like they are learners too. Um, there's been a move to restore the Pell Grant access for prisoners and frankly, it's got great <laughs> effects. People will transition out at higher rates and they won't go back in. This isn't rocket science. Um, 
I just think that overall we've got this massive focus throughout the entire system on punishing people. It's all punitive. I think the way they look at children from a young age is punitive to begin with. And there's so much we would be doing if we looked at people as a continual learner and as having um, opportunity in front of them, whether they're 40 and stuff went wrong when they were 21 or not. Um, I, I've seen that succeed in our city many times. I, I had the incredible honor of working with a CCP student who was incarcerated for something she should never have been incarcerated for and spent years in there and went through so much trauma that I am boggled at what she can do. It took a long time for college to stick for her on the way out, but the reason that she can pay the bills and is raising her son the way she is is because we didn't view that as a lifelong mark on her. So I think this goes kind of all the way through. And, and uh, you know, we lock up the most people in the world. Um, so prisoners is kind of like part of that business plan. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the way these schools are structured are, is a dehumanizing space for a lot of kids, where even to the point, like I was saying, my oldest son, he doesn't like school. And I don't know if I can fix that anymore because of his experience in a school that did that to him. Um, and I try to tell them, well, school and education aren't the same thing. <laughs> you know, those are two different realities. And still, he's like, it just reinforces in him, no matter how much I try to tell him, like, you should learn how the, the game works and learn how to manipulate that game towards your interest. He, he still is like, well, I'm bored. I don't like it. And move on, you know. And I was like, yeah, but you're in seventh grade, man. You can't get straight Fs in all your subjects. That's not cool. And, and you know, I'm a teacher. So how does that look? Um, <laughs> So uh, with, all, with all that being said, you know, we, we have to address that. And I just want to say one controversial thing about resegregation of schools. Um, I don't know what we actually solved with Brown versus Board of Education ultimately in the long term. Um, I always say to my students, you know, Brown versus the Board, Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65. Uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act 68. I'm like, oh, that's all good, but what did that mean to a poor black kid living in a project building in Philadelphia? That supposedly those things even apply to. So like, and then you look at the situation in Philadelphia, I believe we would benefit more from purposeful socioeconomic integration of the schools. And I think that is, if we do that first, and then we do a purposeful recruitment of more uh, black and brown educators in those schools, and even in uh, schools with majority white populations, because white people do make up about 70% of our population, I think that would fundamentally shift and add more human capital into communities that need it desperately, but then also rise the level of expectations of the teachers, administrators, and of the students within those buildings. I mean, you're, I wish I worked under you. Um, because I, I, I've, I've had, I was lucky enough to have one administrator that was on that same page that defended, that like held back all the nonsense that I know you guys get from above y'all. Um, but that's a rare thing for, for most teachers. And, and we don't have those levels of support and even just like a humanizing space. So then teachers end up like prison guards, talking about in the teacher lounge about knuckleheads and other you know, seemingly uh, race neutral ways to describe problematic behavior that they pathologize, pathologicalize the students with, um, racially based. So school prison pipeline is just like, we could play lip service, and that's what we do most of the time. But at the end of the day, I don't see any real movement happening to stop that, except from on the grassroots level. I want to thank you all for coming, and I ask that we give our panelists a round of applause for joining us today.